Hello and a warm welcome to our service here at Castle Church Stafford at the end of what's been a very hot week, hasn't it? Well, whether you're watching online, on YouTube Live, Facebook Live or on our church website or you're watching this later on DVD, you're all very, very welcome. Well, today in our service, we're going to be continuing our series in Luke's Gospel, looking at the last section of Jesus' Sermon in Chapter 12. But we begin with our call to worship, reminding us why we're here and who we've come to worship. If you would join in with the words that are in black, bold type. So we meet together as the church of Jesus Christ and declare together, we are his people, saved by Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, to the glory of God alone, according to God's word alone. This is the truth on which we stand, justified before our Creator. We bless the Lord for our salvation, won for us at great cost. Well, our opening song this morning is based on Isaiah chapter 12, reminding us that God is our salvation. So join with me as we sing together. Well, that song really exalts God. It reminds us of a great character, 
that we find revealed in the pages of Scripture. And as we look at, as we think about just how great he is, we acknowledge that on our own merit, through the things we've done, we aren't worthy to come into his glorious presence. But of course, God's made it possible for us through the sacrificial death of Jesus. If we come to him in repentance, he will forgive us. So we can stand as righteous before our perfect, holy, and glorious God. So then we confess our sinfulness and shortcomings and ask for his renewal in our lives. As God's people, we pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. So then listen to these words of assurance that our sins are forgiven. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we respond to God's amazing mercy and grace to us as we declare to each other that we're forgiven through the blood of Christ and commit ourselves to living under his lordship. The words of these songs, this song says, I stand in Christ with sins forgiven and Christ in me, the hope of heaven, my highest calling and my deepest joy to make his will my home. We sing together, There is a Hope. Yeah. 
Well, as I said, you are all very welcome this morning. And just having a look at some of the uh, comments on Facebook this morning, there's some really good ones this morning. Uh, those were on Facebook. Um, yeah, um, first of all, an apology uh, from the Mid-Trent gang that they usually join us on a Sunday morning. Uh, but they've uh, opened their church for private prayer for the first time uh, this morning. So I hope that's a, a real blessing to all your uh, 10 churches down the Mid-Trent. Uh, let's see who's watching. Uh, Pauline says she's watching. Uh, Gary and Val. Uh, Gary says, praise the Lord my soul. I forget not all his benefits. Amen. He forgives all my sins. Thank goodness. Yes, indeed. Uh, Rosemary responds, uh, indeed. Hallelujah. Um, so, Sam, morning everyone, watching with my tribe, uh, and Catherine and Damien and their gang. That's wonderful uh, that you're all together uh, watching the service. That's brilliant. Um, Anita, good morning to you all. Trevor's watching as well. This is a good one. Simon Hudson watching from Shallowford House. He says, good morning, everyone. I'm watching you whilst babysitting our new pea chicks born yesterday. I have actually seen photographs of that. And uh, Roz replies to him. He said, come on, we want to see a photograph of them. Um, I have seen a photograph of them. I don't know whose photograph I saw, uh, whether it's my Annie's or Claire's or something like that. Um, Simon, if you've got um, a picture, if you email it to um, castlechurchstafford at gmail.com, um, then we might be able to shove it up on the screen. Uh, but don't worry if you haven't. Um, but it, they do look absolutely adorable, um, which is great. Um, my mum's here, that's good. Uh, Marion's here, uh, Chris Ashton and Tony Ashton. Louise is watching. Uh, Mary Yates, Neil Ashton and Michelle. Uh, Emma Price is watching, that's good. Um, who else? Uh, Helen's watching from Canterbury. Of course, our Chandler's Ford gang um, are watching. Um, and Jennifer from Woodsieves, which is Pauline's sister, right? We got that wrong last week. It's Pauline's sister who's also watching. Uh, Rachel's way, uh, watching. Good morning, all. Um, Anita's watching. Anita Hall. Uh, Janet Roberts, of course, is watching. Uh, my sister's watching from Devon. That's good. Helen and Hayden are watching. Um, Elizabeth's watching from Nottinghamshire. Elizabeth and Craig in Nottinghamshire. Um, yeah, who else? Who have I not mentioned? Oh, Grace, Tom and Annie are, are all watching, of course. Uh, Julia's watching from Croydon. Um, Ross says she's sneaking in late at the back as usual, um, and on the video too, yes indeed, <laughs> yes I noticed that. Um, John Trumbull is watching with all the Troubles, or the Trumbulls, whichever you want to call them. Uh, Claire Thomas is watching, Ali uh, is watching. Claire Mills says, whoops I'm late, morning everyone, uh, which is good. Um, Ali says, Windy Bridgeford this morning. Um, Christine's watching from Liverpool, that's great. Uh, Ashley's watching from over in the Netherlands, that's great. Good morning all, she says, God bless. Uh, Pauline um, says she really likes this live stream, that's great. And uh, Louise says that was beautiful music. Yeah, I think Annie and Gary make such a lovely job of that, there is a hope. Um, uh, and Simon's just messaged us back, he says, that's far too technical for me. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> we did try. Um, but anyway, that's great. All right, okay, we've got one or two uh, notices that we need to uh, talk about. Uh, first of all, you'll have seen on the news that the government have announced um, that uh, they're going to allow services to restart um, from, um, is it next week? Yeah, from, from next week. Um, we're not, we haven't got all the details about that yet. We're, gonna, we're expecting them either Monday or Tuesday, all the rules um, for being able to meet, etc. Can I just say that it's unlikely that we're going to be able to meet any time in the very near future. We've got to think safety first. We've also got to do all the risk assessments and paperwork as well. Um, so we're also looking at open air services as well. Uh, the government are also going to give us uh, details about that. Um, you've got to realize that we're quite a large church in a very small building. So actually, it's not going to be that easy uh, to meet. Um, we maybe start a midweek service first, although that's unlikely to be communion to start off with. All right. So do watch this space. Do read the email that we send around on a Friday, and that will give you more details. 
Okay, and um, so if you've got anything, comments or suggestions or ideas uh, behind meeting, uh, then do get in touch with us. Or, or maybe join us after this service on Zoom as well, because last week we had a really good conversation about how we would take communion and how we would meet together. So do join us after this service on Zoom. We can have a really good chat about it then. On Wednesday, we have uh, Big Books of the Bible at 10 a.m. Uh, it was absolutely hilarious last week watching some of the mums have a go at doing the, um, the Big Books Challenge. And I think um, Catherine went to the top of the leaderboard with 29, um, which is 10 more than the, ne the next nearest person. There's no two ways about it. I'm going to have to have a go to try and beat Catherine. Of course, then Catherine will want a, a go to beat me because Catherine uh, doesn't let anybody beat her because she's that competitive. But never mind, last Big, uh, big Books of the Bible on Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, on the Facebook page. As I said, after this service, uh, we've got Zoom coffee. Uh, do just do join us for that. We've sent out all the links. Uh, you can just bob in, say hello to everybody if you want to, and, uh, and then leave again. We're probably there for around about half an hour, three quarters of an hour, something like that. But it's just lovely to see people's faces. So do uh, join us for a little bit uh, of that afterwards if you can. Next, Open Church. Um, so... We didn't have as many people come this last Wednesday, but we are going to carry on uh, opening from 1.30 to 3.30 on Wednesday because we realise that quite a good number of our church family have been shielding, uh, and the shielding lifts on Tuesday, uh, and therefore they may be able to come into church on, uh, on Wednesday. So we'll give it a go uh, on Wednesday to see if there's uh, as much uptake from 1.30 to 3.30 Wednesday afternoon. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is this morning's sermon. Now, this morning's sermon is a very, very difficult subject, and it's a subject that affects a lot of us, and it, including me. Now, I did think very carefully about how or whether I did preach this sermon or not, um, because I don't want to hide behind a camera lens to do something that is so important, but I am going to um, preach it this morning, um, but I am aware that it, it might affect one or two people, and if you want to chat about it or pray about it, then please do get in touch with me. I'm more than willing to chat through um, the subject of this morning's sermon with you if you need to. Well, we're going to turn to prayer now, and we're going to join with millions of Christians around the world today as we say together the creed. So we declare, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy worldwide church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So we'll now say together the special prayer for today. So together we pray. Graciously hear us, Lord God. And grant that we, to whom you have given the desire to pray, may be defended by your mighty aid and strengthened in all dangers and adversities. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now Barbara will lead us in our intercessions. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, which tells us that without him we can't grow and be fruitful. We are joined to Christ as in the grafting of a vine, and we pray to him, knowing that he will react to our prayers in the way best for us. We ask in prayer with humility. And when I say, Lord, please answer our prayer, would you respond with me through your grace and mercy? Amen. Vines go through change during the seasons. And we pray that as we move through the ups and downs of the seasons of our lives, we will learn to move on and let go of the joys, worries, and disappointments that come our way. 
allowing God to use the experiences to make us more like him. Currently, we are living through the coronavirus crisis. The Bible urges us to trust in God and not be afraid, but still we're a nation in great fear of something we can't see. As our government seeks to release our lives little by little, please grant a right understanding of the way forward as they rely on medical expertise and a willingness on behalf of us all to continue to show caution where necessary, but an acceptance that risk will always be a factor in all we do. In our anxiety be our hope, and in the darkness our light. Calm our distress and give us strength to cope. Lord, please answer our prayer. Through your grace and mercy. Amen. In spring, the life-giving sap in the vine provides the nutrients for growth. We pray that you will keep us focused on developing our relationship with you. Thank you for the Bible teaching we have here at Castle Church. We have real gospel spiritual teaching. Thank you for bringing Philip for that purpose and for those who work alongside him and contribute such valuable help. We pray for Chris, Roy, Alan, Owen and Roz, that you will continue to guide them in their preaching and teaching for all ages. As the vine supports the branches, we pray that we will continue to be a fellowship which brings about growth in those new Christians unfamiliar with much of the Bible's teaching. May they grow in their faith through what they see, hear and read. We ask for your blessing on all those organisations who provide Bible reading notes, publish and distribute Christian material or work to spread the gospel online. Lord, please answer our prayer through your grace and mercy. Amen. In summer, the vine's deep roots help it to survive dry conditions. We need to find God at a deeper level so that when trials come, be it temptation or persecution, we can respond through a deep faith. Temptation comes to us all at some point. Many things try to discourage and defeat our resolve to be fruitful for you, Lord. Help us to pray through each situation and then to listen, obey and stand firm as we remember you are in control and never tempt us beyond our ability to cope. Give us that deep faith which will allow us to conquer all temptations. We remember those areas of the world where people suffer continuously, places like East Africa and Pakistan, dealing with not just coronavirus but a plague of locusts. There are many Christians among those facing famine as a result. We pray that help will continue to be enabled to come from Christian organisations like Barnabas Fund. Help us not to forget that although media attention is focused on developed countries most of the time, life for the marginalised and persecuted continues all over the world. May we help through prayer and giving to mission. Lord, please answer our prayer. Through your grace and mercy. Amen. The vine grows with the express purpose of producing good fruit at harvest time. God wants us to be fruitful and fulfilled and a blessing to others. The world does not especially admire what the Bible tells us are the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. God sees whether we are maturing into a good crop like the grapes or whether we are going to disappoint him like some grapes which fail to meet the required standard. We pray for ourselves that we will not be distracted from the gospel message but firmly rooted in Bible truths, fed by the Spirit with a heart to love others, bringing them to know Jesus. Lord, please answer our prayer through your grace and mercy. Amen. After the harvest, the vine is soon ready for pruning. Off come branches which didn't bear fruit, plus a reduction in the amount of healthy growth in order for the vine to bear more fruit in the future. We pray that when God as gardener prunes our lives, if it's for discipline, then help us to respond and turn away from what we do which saddens him. God is not punishing, but training us in his way for steady growth in our Christian life. 
Sometimes we grow in the wrong direction. We do what we want. Sometimes we resist the life God wants us to lead. We ask forgiveness for not following a God who loves us and only wants the best for us. Lord, please answer our prayer through your grace and mercy. Amen. As we grow in our Christian life, we are preparing for the promise of an eternal life to come. Providing the vine receives the right weather conditions and is tended well by the gardener, it can expect to live through many winters. But we have no idea when our life on earth will end. The Bible tells us to be ready. In the winter time of our life and as illness strikes, help us to keep our focus on you. Today, we remember those in our fellowship with health issues, Andrea, Alan, Marion, Scott, Alistair, Chris Carter, Jan Roberts, Jean, John and Barbara, John and Jill, Peter, and those in nursing homes, Harry, Doris, Jill, Rosemary Davis. May they not be fearful, but trust in a God who understands and cares for them. In Reading last weekend, we heard of three fatal stabbings. We pray that relatives and friends may be comforted by a Christian presence in such distressing circumstances. Help us to speak out against violence and wrongdoing. Lord, please answer our prayer through your grace and mercy. Amen. Thank you for the way the Bible teaches us today through the wisdom of the parables. May we continue as fruitful branches and allow the gardener and the vine to help us grow and deliver the harvest. Amen. So we pray the Lord's Prayer. Together we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, as we get ready to hear God speak to us from his word, we ask for his help to hear, understand, and change our lives. Together we pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Well, the government's announcements this week on weddings was excellent news for one of our church family, because it means that Megan will be able to marry Tom as planned on the 11th of July. And as soon as we knew that, then Megan and Tom came to swear their affidavits for their special marriage license, because of course we haven't been able to read their bands. And we met, socially distanced of course, in the church building to talk through the wedding uh, this last Wednesday. Uh, while she was here, we videoed her doing our reading for today. So I'm sure you'll enjoy this as Megan reads in our old church building with the sun streaming in right in front of the old Norman stone in the North Isle. So Megan. This reading is taken from Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 49. I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? 
As you are going with your adversary to the magistrate, try hard to be reconciled to him on the way, or he may drag you off to the judge, and the judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, after their wedding, uh, Megan and Tom are both joining the staff of City Church in Birmingham. So please do pray for them as they begin their married life serving God together. Well, as we've seen in these closing verses of Luke 12, Jesus is reminding us that he's coming again. And so in preparation to hear what he has to say to us in these verses, we're going to sing together, Lift Up Your Heads to the Coming King. Simon has sent uh, a couple of pictures of the, uh, the little um, pea chicks that have been born. We, we just haven't had time to get them onto the system because he struggled um, in order to do the technology. But um, we're going to try and show them over Zoom. Zoom. So we'll share screen at, uh, screen at Zoom time and let you see the, the pictures of the new uh, little birds. Well, in our summer series, we've been looking at Jesus' sermon in Luke chapter 12. And he's had some really interesting themes in verses 1 to 12. He talks about fearing God more than other people who might harm us. In verses 13 to 34, he talks about investing in the kingdom of God, not earthly things. Verses 35 to 48, being ready and faithful as we look for Jesus' return. And as we look at this last section of his sermon, what do you expect? A nice warming thought to end with? Well, that's what you're expecting, you're probably going to be disappointed. Because what we read in these verses is some of the most uncomfortable stuff that ever comes out of Jesus' mouth. And we might want to recoil at the words he uses, words like judgment and fire and division. And I think there are probably at least three reasons why we might recoil in horror at what Jesus says. First, We live in a 21st century culture that really doesn't like anything that smacks of being dogmatic. As we've seen over the last few weeks, the backlash from J.K. Rowling's arguments about transgender. Our society is very wary of any kind of speaking in straightforward ways, expressing views that are firm and clear. I mean, it's arrogant and intolerant to speak like that, isn't it? But as Christians, we have a faith that's been revealed. God's spoken clearly in a straightforward way. Whether we agree with him or like what he says or don't like what he says, there are no shades of grey when our sovereign God has spoken. Because he loves us, he's challenging 
uncompromising, and most of all, truthful. Second reason we might recoil is that there's a kind of unwillingness to be thought of as negative, to speak against what others think, believe, or say. But if real ultimate truth exists, and as Christians we believe it does, because Jesus says in John 14 that he's the way, the truth, the life, not our way, our truth, and our life, then of course real truth involves exclusions. What's not true? And our culture and society doesn't like it. Third reason, this is probably the saddest, I think sometimes the wider church of God has been guilty of not teaching the imperative call of Jesus. Instead of a call to repent and to turn to him, it's been more of a case of, would you like to be happy? Would you like to be fulfilled? Would you like to be satisfied in life? Well, you know, if that's the case, then Jesus could be your guy. Now, of course, Jesus does bring happiness, fulfillment, satisfaction, but they are byproducts byproducts of a faith that starts with the sacrifice of a blood-stained cross. So if we're going to take Jesus seriously, we need to hear his clear, plain speaking. It's why at Castle Church we don't cherry-pick our passages to preach on. We work through a book systematically, not missing stuff that's difficult, however hard it might be to hear. And in that way, the Bible sets the agenda, not the preacher. And in this passage, we hear about Jesus, the dividing line. But just a warning, we need to listen carefully, not selectively. Because at the heart of the message, there's still the good news of God's grace and mercy. So don't make a cup of coffee in the middle so then, let's see what Jesus says. First of all, he says there's an unavoidable judgment in verses 49 to 50. Well, I was reading one boffin this week who said that Jesus talks about God's judgment more than any other character in the Bible. And Jesus is blunt, and it's for our good because he wants us to avoid the unavoidable. Look at verse 49. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Now, in the Bible, fire can mean a variety of different things. Of course, there's the refiner's fire of Malachi and the tongues of fire at Pentecost. But here it's talking about one of the Bible's main uses of fire imagery, and that is judgment. Now, we started this series in Luke 1, and we've preached through every single verse, so, five house points, if you can remember, where this theme has appeared before. No, no one? It's Luke chapter 3 at Jesus' baptism. What does John the Baptist say? John, uh, Luke chapter 3. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Do you see? Jesus brings salvation. He brings rescue, but he also brings judgment. The mention of wheat and chaff in those verses is a farming picture where the farmer separates out the useful wheat from the bits of stalk or husk that can't be used. It gets separated out and thrown into the fire. So in Jesus' words, the chaff are people who just ignore him. It is a painful reality that Jesus is coming back as judge. His first coming was in love, grace, and mercy to bring salvation and a new start. But at his second coming, he'll come as the judge and bring his perfect justice. And in verse 49, Jesus says that he wishes that his fire of judgment was already kindled. Jesus longs for judgment and justice to come on the world. Why? Because it means all the evil and injustice that we see around us will be sorted out. And in a way, that's what we all want, isn't it? 
You see, if your friend gets mugged in the street, you want the person who did it to be caught and dealt with. When you see terrorism, like we've seen in Reading this week, you want to see the evil man who did it face real justice. When you see brutal, evil dictators seemingly unjust get away with stuff, you want, them to see, you want to see them deposed, don't you? You want to see them face judgment for their heinous treatment of their fellow man. So let's face it, in lots of situations, we wish that the fire of judgment was already kindled. With Jesus, we cry out for the fire of justice. But you see, the problem is, we can't just have judgment and justice on the things we think deserve it. We don't set the bar at which justice is meted out. And if that perfect fire of judgment came today, we'd all be in danger of facing it ourselves. Because in reality, we are all guilty. Very often, we don't even live up to our own standards, let alone God's perfect ones. And all of us have the inbuilt ability to deny responsibility for our actions. So, for example, you go in the kitchen. The wall is full of crayon scribbles. You look at your child with crayon in hand and ask, did you do that? No, they say. Yes, you reply. And let's face it, we adults are no better. We always have a plausible reason for our sin, an excuse or just the ability to deny that it's our fault. But at the end of the day, we are all guilty. Fire is coming. Judgment is unavoidable. We'll all face justice. Well, that's not good news. Where's the message of God is love and peace on earth, goodwill to all men gone? Well, we need to read on into verse 50. Because there we see that it's a judgment that Jesus has already fa uh, faced for us. Look at verse 50. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is completed. So what's that about baptism? Well, it's not talking about water baptism. We know Jesus has already been baptized with water back in chapter 3. No, Jesus is talking about the cross here. Because on the cross, as Jesus died, all the crushing weight of our sin was placed on Jesus. And when he died that horrific death, he was taking the full judgment of God on our sin on himself. He received the full penalty of what we deserve. It wasn't just a physical death. It was a spiritual death as well as his father turned his face away. It was a God-forsaken baptism. And Jesus says here that he is distressed until it's completed. That's why those words of Jesus on the cross, it is finished, are some of the most glorious in the whole of the Bible. And the remarkable thing is that he went through all that so we won't have to. So where's the whole idea of God is love? There it is. There it is at the cross. Where's the peace on earth? Well, it's the peace that we have being in a relationship with God, our creator, because of the cross. We sang about it last week, didn't we? How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. The fact that he took all that on himself so I wouldn't have to face judgment. What is a Christian? Well, it's not a morally good person or someone who goes to church or who prays. Hopefully a Christian will do all those things, but no, a Christian is someone who's put all their hope and trust in the fact that Jesus died in their place and took on himself the punishment for their sin, rebellion, and guilt, knowing that on their own, relying on their own goodness, they'll never be able to stand God's fire of judgment. Either we'll pay for our sin or we'll allow Jesus to do it for us. 
It's the unavoidable question that we all face. Who will take the rap for my sin, me or Jesus? There is an unavoidable judgment. Second, there's an inevitable division, verses 51 to 53. If all I've said is true, and it is because God's word says it is, then naturally it creates a fault line through the whole of the human race. You're on one side or the other. You're either a Christian who's been rescued from God's judgment or you're not. There is no sitting on the fence because indifference to Jesus, just ignoring him, is exactly the same as rejection. And verses 51 to 53 talk about the practical consequences of that. Look what it says, verse 51. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Reconciliation with God our Heavenly Father can and often does lead to rejection from others. But it's important to look carefully at what Jesus is not saying here. So in verse 51, Jesus is definitely not saying that he's against peace. As I've just said, Jesus brings peace with God. And of course, that relationship can lead to peace with others. I know of a couple who married young and had a baby, and then the marriage fell apart in their early 20s and they got divorced. And after that, the husband became a Christian. The wife saw what a difference it made to him, so she investigated the Christian faith and ended up becoming a Christian as well. And they began to rebuild their relationship and ended up getting remarried. And when they tell the story, they always say, well, at the end of the day, our divorce didn't just work out. The cross can bring peace between people, but sadly, it can also bring division. When people are on opposite sides, of that fault line in humanity. Jesus is also not saying that he's deliberately come to divide people. Jesus is not in the business of destroying families. But if we follow Jesus, then some, if not all of our relationships, will be affected. Why? Well, put simply, not everyone responds kindly to Jesus' offer of new life and reconciliation with God. The human heart recoils from being told it's corrupt and sinful and that we all have to stand before God and give an account of our lives to him. So it will mean relationships with others are affected. As we live our lives in relationship and obedience with our loving Heavenly Father, and as we try graciously to share our faith with all those around us, some will inevitably turn against us. In our prayer meeting, just before lockdown, we were hearing the story of a teenage Muslim girl who became a Christian, and her own father then vowed to kill her, took her outside, and tried to set her on fire. Now, that's extreme. But of course, I expect there are a few in our church family who've experienced that tension to a greater or lesser extent with a non-believing spouse or antagonistic parents. So, for example, the pressure not to go to church or not to take the children to church on a Sunday in favor of doing something else. The tension of bringing those children up with two competing worldviews, one that wants to follow Christ, one who's totally against the idea. Are we ready for that, to put our neck on the line for Jesus' sake? People will either receive him or reject him. And when they do reject him, they may reject us in the process. And we need real courage to take the flack. Maybe revisit those words 
in verses 1 to 12, asking, who do we fear more, God or man? Third, Jesus is not saying that we should be deliberately disruptive. The Bible's commands to honor our parents, to love our husbands and wives still stand, but not at the cost of our allegiance to the Lord Jesus. There is a cost because following Jesus is even more important than blood ties. So there's an unavoidable decision. There's an inevitable division. Sorry, an unavoidable decision, inevitable division. Finally, there's a stark warning in verses 54 to 59. And Jesus gives these two little word pictures to make his point. The first is in verses 54 to 56, and it's about weather forecasting. Verse 54, he said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Well, apparently, so the boffins tell me, simple weather forecasting in Israel exactly the same today. Listen to Jerusalem radio weather forecast, and they'll tell you that the winds are blowing from the south. So put your sun cream and hat on. Or the wind's coming down from the north, so put a jumper and take your brolly out with you. In verse 56, Jesus tells them, you hypocrites, you're obviously good at reading the weather signs, but you can't read the signs of the times. Spiritually speaking, you deliberately shut your minds to all the evidence before you. You're great at seeing a literal storm approaching, but can't or won't see the spiritual storm of God's judgment approaching. Then he changes his word picture to talk about a civil court, verse 57. Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you are going with your adversary to the magistrate, try hard to be reconciled to him on the way, or he may drag you off to the judge, and the judge will turn you over to the officer, and the officer will throw you in prison. I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. His point is simply, act now before it's too late. It's much better to admit your guilt now than face the judgment on judgment day when you will face the full penalty. In other words, settle your account with God today. Get it sorted before his judgment falls. As we go out our, about our daily life in lockdown or not, we don't tend to think about this kind of stuff, do we? Because we're not facing judgment today. But as we saw last week, we just don't know when that day will be. We'll either die and face him, or he'll return and we'll face him. And if we haven't put our trust in that baptism of Jesus on the cross, when he took our sin and judgment on himself, then it'll be too late. But at the end of a very difficult and a very sobering sermon, we need to remind ourselves that the judge himself has come early to offer us an out-of-court settlement. That's why the message of the cross is, I will take it all for you. Come to me, put your trust in me before it's too late. If you knew that a hurricane or a tsunami was on its way to near where you live, and you saw a warning on the telly or social media, you'd be a complete fool to ignore the warnings, thinking, ah, I'll be okay. I'm strong. I'm a good swimmer. In these verses, Jesus gives us the warnings. That he's coming to judge. He sent the warnings. Are you going to be wise or foolish? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus is the perfect and righteous judge who will come and bring his perfect justice on all the injustice we see around us. But we also recognize that as sinners, we will also face that justice. Thank you that in your great love, you provided the solution to that coming judgment, offering that out-of-court settlement won at the cross. 
So we pray that everyone watching and listening this morning will put their trust in the salvation won for us at Calvary. Finally, Lord, we come in humility, knowing that our faith in you may cause division even within our family circles. Help us to be gracious and winsome as we share the good news with them, and help us to be godly examples for you in whatever situation you've placed us. But Lord, help us to stand firm for you, knowing that our first allegiance is to you, our Saviour and our Lord. So it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, our closing hymn this morning picks up that theme of our sin being laid on Jesus on the cross. Till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God is satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. We'll sing together in Christ alone.
So then we'll have our prayer of commission. Go in peace as the reaffirmed church of Jesus Christ. We go to be his body in a broken world. May the grace of God and the love of Christ go with us. Amen. May the peace of the Lord Christ go. Jesus.